So our final speaker is Ryan Singer. He works at Basecamp in Chicago, where they develop Basecamp, which I'm sure uh, many of you have used or definitely heard of. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about design today. So let's bring on Ryan. All right. Am I? OK, I hear my voice. Good. OK, it works. Uh, great to see everybody. Uh, it's really awesome to be here. Um, I uh, actually really enjoy talking about design to programming audiences. Um, you know, it turns out that a lot of the folks who, who get into design kind of come from more graphic design background, which can actually, which is honestly just not important with software. You know, like the fonts and the colors and the way that it looks, it just actually doesn't matter that much. And um, it can be a big distraction when you start to try and learn for yourself. You know, uh, if you're trying to learn UI, if you feel like when you're working on an app and you feel like the UI could be better, you start like Googling around and seeing, is there anything out there that can help me to do this better? And it's all stuff about fonts and how to make the, like how to position the buttons and stuff like that. Do you guys know what I mean? Yeah, right? It's like, it's a lot of BS, actually. It's a lot of art, and, and it doesn't have a lot to do with really making software. Um, and uh, I had such a good experience as a sort of UI person when I started to get into programming. That was in around 2003 when I started working on Basecamp with, uh, you know, with the product with Jason and David at Basecamp. And at that time, you know, David was creating the first version of Rails, which probably many of you are familiar with because I think Laravel is inspired by this, some similar ideas, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah OK. And, um, uh, uh, and at, the, at the time, I was kind of having this experience that a lot of designers have, where you're trying to make a, an idea that you have. You've got some idea for some cool app. So you start designing it, but then you get stuck and you're kind of waiting for a programmer. And uh, I could imagine that maybe some of you have had the flip experience of that, where you, you can program it all, and you can make a schema, and you can get everything wired up, and then it's kind of like, well, is this, is this, here's my bootstrap UI, <laughs> right? You know? And um, it's, it's practical, you know? Um, and uh, so what, what I would like to do today is, is share some ways of thinking about how to actually make UI that are helpful instead of more stuff about fonts and buttons. Uh, so I'm hoping that when you go to sit down to your next project that you actually have some, some productive ideas where you're like, oh, here's, here's where I could actually make this better in a way that's, that's meaningful. And um, there's one little assumption that I just want to mention up front because it can be missed sometimes, which is that we're so used to thinking of design as the skin, that you kind of have to fight back the, the notion of that when you start off, right? And um, the way that we work at Basecamp and the way that I've done many, many side projects that I've coded and designed myself, and I always do it the same way where the design is actually the thing that's kind of like leading what the programming should be, right? It's kind of like, I think I heard that there was a very good talk on, on TDD earlier in this workshop, in this conference. And the notion of TDD is you're kind of starting with your interface and you're working toward your implementation, right? And that way you're not building blindly, but you know what you're building toward all the time. And uh, a sort of design-led software development is the same way. It's just that rather than the interface of an API being the starting point that we're kind of aiming toward, it's we're stepping back even a bit further and we're saying what's the interface to the human situation where the person needs this thing and is trying to get it to do something for them, right? What should it actually do, okay? So if you're in a situation where your kind of design is downstream from programming, then all you can do is skin. But when you're working on your own projects, you can alternate. You can say, I'm going to give the design a moment to be in charge and see if I want to actually re rethink my controllers, rethink the structure of the app, because I'm going to be able to make a significantly more functional app. Okay, So that's just sort of the framing of what I wanted to start off with. And I've got a couple examples that I want to walk through to show you how to think about UI design. But before I do that, I've got like one or two kind of key concepts that are the, the, the ground that we stand on. Um, so I mentioned in the beginning that it's not about art, it's not about style, it's not about 2D graphic design. So what is it about? So the first cut 
is to, is to stop thinking about what we look at on the two-dimensional screen as being something stylistic. And in order to do that, we need this concept that comes from the UI design world. And that is the, this, this word that you may have seen. It's called an affordance. And an affordance is, this word actually comes from before uh, software. It comes from some other research. But an affordance is a thing in the environment in front of you that you can act with. Okay, and the sort of canonical example is a door handle, right? So there's this thing and you see it and you know what it can do and then you grab it and because that thing is there, you can open a door and you can walk through, right? Or the glass is designed in such a way that it can hold liquid and then when you tip it, you can, you can, you can take it in in a controlled way, right? It's a, so there's a meaning to, the, to, to, to this thing and this is, this is a general notion of affordance. And it's easy to apply this notion to UI because right away you probably know what they, what they are, right? They're the buttons, they're the fields, they're the, the links, the drag handles, all the things that you can manipulate in order to act. And so the first step is to stop thinking about uh, pixels and to think about affordances. But as soon as we start thinking about an affordance, then we have to kind of ask the question, which is, what is this affording me to do? What is the action that this button or this slider is here to, to enable? And the thing is that if you look at a screen and you say, how is my design? That's in 2D space. But if you say, what action am, am I enabling? Actions all happen along the arrow of time, right? An action has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So you approach the door, you, 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 you pull it open, and then you walk through it. And all of that happens in successive moments. So this, uh, the core idea of real UI design is actually when you bring time in and you get into 3D, which is the 2D screen plus different moments, beginning, middle, and end of different processes. And the word that we use when we're talking about UI, at least in Basecamp, is we always talk about flows. And flows are the chains of affordances that you put together in the app to allow things to happen. And right away, there's a very big shift when we start talking about uh, flows instead of this 2D puzzle game of making it look good. And the big difference there is that if I am putting something together and I'm saying, like, how is my interface? Does my interface look good? There's no criteria objectively to judge that, right? Like, I can look at that and say, oh, I, I like it, or I don't like it, or the, it fits the elite style that people who decide what's cool say sh it should look like, or whatever, right? Like, there's no meaning to it, right? It's just like, how does it look? I don't know. But if the question is about the flow, about which actions does it afford, then it's objective. So instead of saying, like, is the door handle made out of silver, or is it made out of brass, or what, sh what shape should it be? You say, okay, can you pull it? Can you walk through it? Does it creak? Right? Now we have an objective measure of what the app, like whether we're doing something good or not. So we're sh kind of shifting the focus. And the design of flows comes out of situations. That's the other big thing that I'm going to talk about, is that this ties to what's actually going on outside the software in the world. And I want to use a very uh, kind of simple example that I hope will resonate. So because every time we sit down to design the UI for our app. We have some kind of a model in mind of like other stuff that we've seen that we're kind of copying, you know? And I think for a lot of us, like I think back to my, the first apps that I ever made were like, you know, Claris Works databases and FileMaker and stuff like that, you know? It was like, you take some kind of uh, table of information that the system is gonna track and then uh, and expose it as a whole bunch of fields and you, you have, you know, basically like CRUD, right? That we've got some information, we're just gonna expose it and let you manipulate it and save it. Um, but I think that even though a lot of us have in, sort of inherited that model of what a UI is, a much better one is, is something like an ATM. An ATM is, looks nothing like a typical CRUD app. Uh, it's a very distinct set of flows that correspond to very specific situations. And I want to actually use this as an example because you all know what an ATM is, so I'm not going to enlighten you by describing the functions of an ATM right now. But uh, uh, what I want to show is the, 
the tools of, of notation and how we actually talk about UI and draw UI, okay? And um, if we sit down and look at an ATM, uh, this, is, this is using a little bit of a, a little notation shorthand that's, that's very useful for this kind of thing. There's, there's something like, like a prompt, well, let's call it. That's the screen that you see when you first walk up to an ATM machine. And um, that is uh, basically the thing that tells you, hey, swipe your card, otherwise I've got nothing for you, right? And um, the, the, the little notation here is that um, I'm going to uh, draw, uh, uh, write out the screen that we're looking at, and then I'm gonna draw a bar, and under that I'm gonna put the actions that you can do, okay? So under the prompt, there is a, um, you know, I thought that this thing had a mode where it wouldn't, uh, that's better, okay, good. Um, so under the prompt, I, I, I basically I can't do anything other than swipe or insert the card. That's the only action I can perform. Uh, and when I do that, that takes me to another state, another screen, which is the enter your pin screen, right? And um, I can enter my pin, and then after I, after I type that in, I can hit enter or you know, whatever, the, whatever the text of the button is. And that's gonna take me to a main menu. And from there, I've got a few options. Now we've got some different, we're not just down a tunnel. Now I can do, you know, I can do fast cash. I can do uh, withdrawal. I can do a deposit or I could check my balance. Can you all read that? Are we doing okay on size? Yeah, yeah? okay, good. Um, and uh, so let's just say we go to, we go to withdrawal, right? So the withdrawal, there's a, there's a dedicated screen for that. I'll just write that in shorthand. And um, I, I'm gonna have some affordance to enter an amount. And then other than that, it's pretty simple. I can just say, do it, right? Um, so I, I, can, I can basically submit. And I can also cancel. I could go back and say, oh, that's not what I wanted. And if I submit, if I, if I say do the withdrawal, it's gonna spit money out, but then it's gonna show me one other thing, which is a kind of, um, it's gonna say uh, what happens next. It says you want another transaction, right? So, uh, another. And then I have yes or, or no, I'm done, right? And then we know what happens from there. And uh, to, to sort of contrast that, there's, there's also, I'm gonna just do one more right here, which is the fast cash. And there I've got different actions that I can take. I can just directly say 20, 40, 80, 100, whatever it is, right? And each one of those is gonna spit out the money and ask me if I want another transaction and I have cancel again. So, uh, this is usually kind of how we talk through the flows and how we can kind of interactively just describe a whole system. And what, what we're doing here with this notation is sort of schematically showing not only the processes through time and the actions that are afforded, but also the, afford, the key affordances that are gonna to have to be there. We can start to think through like what has to be there on each of these screens to do this. So the, the, the flows that we just talked about they kind of set requirements for what affordances we need. So for example, if we're talking about the withdrawal screen, now it's time for me to design the UI for the withdrawal screen. I can say, make a withdrawal, and there's gonna be a field for that that says, what's the dollar amount? And I've got a way to say, do it. I've got a submit action, and then maybe I have some kind of a cancel button there. Yeah. and. Uh, here, now this is a very trivial example, right? But what I'm trying to show here is that I don't need to have a bootstrap, I don't need to have uh, something that looks good in some graphic tool. Uh, all I need to know is that the right endpoints are there. So in a way, it's a lot more like API design than it is like graphic design, right? As long as I've got the right ins and outs, then I, this is going to work, right? So by understanding the flow that I'm trying to get through, I know these are the affordances that I need, which are like the API endpoints, yeah? And then it's gonna work for me. Now, I will eventually go from these affordances down to coming up with some kind of nice looking 2D layout. But the 2D layout is not important, right? I'm not gonna have to 
uh, recode everything just because I want to move a button around, right? We have, we have a separation of views from, from the rest of the code for that reason, right? I can always rearrange the furniture. It's not going to get me anywhere. Um, so that's kind of going from the flows down to the affordances, but it also works the other way. Uh, we, have to f the f we don't just pull the flows out of nowhere if we're figuring out what the app should do. There's also a question of, like, what are the, the actions and what are the main paths that I should support? And this is important to ask because these are the things that become controllers and routes and, and it's like they're, they're whole walkways that we have to build through the, through the space of the app. And these flows, they actually come from situations that arise. And this is interesting because we're getting outside of the app now. So here's an example. Uh, I don't know who came up with the idea first, but I, I used Chase ATMs and I started noticing it some years ago that they added this quick cache thing to the, uh, to the pin screen, right? And what happened was, it wasn't just that they said, oh, how can we improve the pin screen today, right? But they noticed that there was a situation that was coming up from their life experience that when you go, when you, that people are just very often in a big rush, yeah? And they just need to get in and out, and it's like a quick errand to like get that cash out. And it's not a question of like, hmm, how much cash should I get? That there's a kind of routine there, right? That there's a, um, it's, a uh, it's a, it's a quick routine just to repeat, right? And they decided that in order to support that action, that they actually needed a totally different flow, right? So what they did is they added this uh, quick cache option to the, to the pin screen, which I think you configure it you know, somewhere else. It knows how much money you like to take out. And if you do that, it, it's a completely different flow. It immediately spits out money, and it doesn't ask you if you want another transaction. It just says thank you. Thanks and goodbye, right? And what's interesting about this is Let's look at withdrawal, fast cash, and quick cash. Here we've got three things that are completely identical from an implementation standpoint, right? It's just a number and the money comes out, right? But uh, it, from an interaction standpoint and situationally, they're different, right? And we not only ended up with like a tweak to a screen, but in this case, there's a new, again, flows have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So we say, how does this start? Right? Quick cash starts from the pin screen, where instead of saying, take me to the menu, you type your code and you say, give me the money. And it doesn't end on, do you want another transaction? It ends on, thanks, we're done. Right? And the card comes out. So that's how the situations come. And if these situations that arise, what this means specifically is, of course, the situation of being in a rush and just doing a routine a routine withdrawal. And the only way that we learn about these situations is by kind of like the last, the last piece of this of this uh, tower, which is, um, you could call it, I mean, you, you guys have probably heard of domain knowledge, right? So uh, domain knowledge, by phrasing it that way, it kind, of, it kind of tends to make you imagine that there's an encyclopedia of stuff that you should know. Uh, like you're gonna, you're gonna talk to the customer all day and then you're gonna come away with a bullet point list and now you have your domain knowledge. And, um, but it's, it's, more like, it's more like life experience. Yeah, but I'm going to call it domain experience, which means like you know what it's like to be the person that uses the thing, right? You've been, you've been there and you've been like, ah, I need this, or why doesn't it do that, or how do I do this, or now it's time to do that, and you understand what it's like to be in that situation. And then when you do that, it's, it's, it, then you understand what the app needs to do. So that's kind of like a quick little tour of the ingredients and the ways of thinking about this. And what I want to kind of, uh, uh, the other big thing that I wanted to share with you is a, is a case study. And it's uh, a simple example of how we often land in a similar situation when we start with a, just a regular program design. Uh, sometimes we have a design that works. We've got some UI that's there, and it's the normal stuff we always make. And the question is, where do I go from here? How do I actually make this better? And um, so I want to just kind of talk you through an example of that. And um, I'm very interested to see, I think it might be familiar with some of the UIs that you guys have made yourselves, and you can let me know that. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of background for this. Um, so 
I've got some friends who run a, uh, it's, a, it's, a it's a big worldwide nonprofit. And there's about 700 different branches of this. And they're all over the world. And some of the branches are like one to 10 people. Some of them are hundreds of people. And they're all over the place. And what they would like to do is to be able to sort of disseminate some information to their members through worldwide all the way through this big network. Um, but they would like it to be kind of protected so it only goes to the members. And the whole thing is, is very big and kind of grassroots and very distributed. And oh, there's a kind of a system in place that doesn't really work where there's one IT thing that's hosted out in Germany somewhere, and you email the one guy, okay, there's 700 branches around the world, you email the one guy and say, hey, can I have access to that thing? And he's like, oh, okay, I guess they want access, okay, yes. And then adds you to the, uh, to the database, right? And uh, so we had this idea that it would be nice to kind of distribute that, that access granting process, yeah? So that if you uh, wanted access to this inside network, that you could say, hey, I'd like to request access to the newsletter and all this stuff. And it would say, well, where are you from? And you'd say, I'm from Chicago. And then it would say, oh, well, here's the nearest person in Chicago. And it would forward the request onto them. And then it would send them a request that says, hey, do you know this? Do you approve this person? And the chances are that you've actually met because you have a local branch there or something. OK. Are you with me with a little case study? Yeah? OK. So the. The natural thing, as a couple programmers designing an information system, is to say, well, you know, they didn't start with, um, with thinking about you know, flows and interactions and stuff. It's like, what's the, what's the schema? <laughs> right? I mean, that's what we all do, really. You know what I mean? Like, OK, what's, what, what tables do I need? Because, come on, everything's Rust, everything's CRUD. That's, that's like the easy path, right? And it's also, I think it's reasonable because we're trying to get our hands around, how am I going to let people manipulate this information? Well, the, the unit of storage is this table anyway. So we start there. And uh, so some friends of mine, they put together this contact database, which is like, we'll have a kind of big member database. And every member will have things like a name and an email and the city that they belong to and maybe an avatar and who knows, they've got all kinds of ideas. But they'll also, you know, there'll be like a status column on each person. Approved or not, yeah, reasonable. And uh, the way that this would work, just very roughly from a flow standpoint, is that somebody would request to become a new member. So they would they would fill out they would fill out the new member form, or like give me access to this thing. They would submit that. That would send them. They would just see something that says thanks. But then there would be a kind of notification that goes out. Uh, that would go to the, this kind of local admin, wherever they are, right? Which would be a, like a new member notification. And that would say, hey, here's something for you to review. Maybe this is an email. And they click review. And where does it take them? Remember, like we, we just started with the schema. And I had this, you know, okay, which of the rest, which of the verbs do I have? Mm. Uh, how about member edit? We'll just take them to an edit member screen. And their only options are just going to be to save or cancel, which is the usual routine in a CRUD app, right? And the edit member screen looked something like this. It was a very tall form. And it said, here's member number 285314. And uh, there was a bunch of fields like every edit crud thing you've ever seen. Too many, of course, because it was everything we could ever think of, right? And you, you, you don't know anything about that, do you? OK. All right. And you're so polite, I can't tell if I'm connecting or not <laughs> sometimes, OK? It's, it's, so uh, there were a lot of fields, you know, name, email, everything like that. But then at the bottom, there was a special, there was a special block. And it said, you know, what's this, what's this person's access? This was like some kind of a column just on the table. And we've got one option, which is um, like pending, or perhaps requested, or whatever. And then the other one is approved, and then submit. OK? This is the kind of junk drawer that we all make and that we all see all the time, I think, right? 
every attribute you need to know on the right table, and then you just like, hey, well, just go to the edit screen and like find the thing you need to change and change it, right? And uh, but uh, my friend met with me and he gave me a demonstration. It said, this is what we've got so far. And the first thing that I tried to do is, well, first of all, something smelled a little bit. And uh, the first thing that smelled was that the title of the screen was edit member. And I couldn't immediately map that to a flow. Now, if you show me a flow, a screen, and it says withdraw money, then I'm like, okay, I'm pretty sure I know the situation that drives this, right? But if it says edit member, it's, it's, it's abstract. It's like, who's editing? and why, and what's, what's the beginning, middle, and end of this? I don't know where they're coming from and where they're trying to go. So uh, I asked him to sort of describe the cases, right? And one case is like, okay, what well, we just described with that flow, right? That, well, they, the, the admin just got the notification, they need to go and they need to change the status. I said, okay. And then, but then also we have individual people who need to go in and they have to change their password or change their email address or change their personal details, right? So well, here's the one form and it does everything, ta-da, right? But programmers love the one thing that does everything. And it's good, it's, it's good because it's, uh, what you want as a programmer is to have an API. You want to have everything that you could possibly need, and then you know how to put it together because that's your thing. But as a user of systems, you don't want all the Legos to, to, to give you whatever you want to do. You just want it to, you, you want it to do it, what, it, what you need it to do. It's, it's a very different mentality on the user side. And so my first instinct when I look at this is I think there's different flows hiding inside of this crud thing, right? And the fact that they're mixed together means that we're gonna have a problem later. And I'll describe that a little bit too, because this is something that happens a lot. So my first instinct was to say, well, what if approval is actually a distinct flow? How would that change this product design? And we thought about that and we said, well, if, if there was something that was just like um, a screen that was presented to the admin that said, approve this person, then the action wouldn't be save or cancel. There would be two very sensible actions, which would be approve and deny, right? And so we wouldn't need this block on this page anymore. We would have a new, a new page and it would look something like this. It would say, would you like to approve this person? And in a read-only fashion, because I'm not editing their information, it would show me their name and their email and their reference or whatever it is that I used to base my decision off of, and then I would have two big buttons, right? Approve or deny, whatever they say, it doesn't matter, right? And now if I do this, I look back at that old screen and I say, well, you know, editable fields didn't make sense for approval before. Uh, but editable fields make perfect sense if I'm a person who's editing my personal information, if I'm actually going there to edit my own info, right? If my email address changed, I need to change my password, I want to put a new avatar, whatever it is. So we could also break this off into a separate flow. So maybe there's something like a, there's like a home page for a member who's already part of the system, and from there they have something like edit your profile. And when they go to that, it takes them to an edit profile page. This is the place to edit your personal, like edit your account or something like that. And then of course I can have my save and my cancel. And now this becomes more focused and instead of that do everything screen, I've got my approval screen, but then I've also got a new, a new screen which is something like a profile page, which I can now design better because it has a distinct purpose and it fits into a distinct situation. I can say, here's the avatar right on top. This is your profile, right? Here's your name and it's in a field, right? And then uh, whatever other fields you might need to change and then we've got a submit button, let's say. Uh, but what if we realize that our authentication is happening through some shared service, right? and we're gonna actually delegate that out to some other screen that's happening on some other URL somewhere. So now, I might have a link that says, if you wanna change your password, go here. And now, if I look at this flow, I've added another significant part to it. Go here to change your password, right? What I'm trying to illustrate here 
is that when you've got one junk drawer that's kind of covering all possibilities, it becomes very difficult to make it do the individual things that it has to do well. And your code starts to suffer for it. If we were using this one master CRUD screen for all these different cases, we'd have to have some conditional logic around the access block, right? Because if you're an admin, you can see it and set it. If you're not an admin, you can't see it, right? If we didn't want to do a conditional block there, we could repeat the whole page and have duplication and say, here's the edit screen that admins see and here's the edit screen that users see. But by separating the concerns, just like we do in good code, now we've got two different flows with very different requirements. Because again, the requirements come from the situation down to the flow, down to the affordances, down to the individual 2D decisions that we make. So the, I think, best example of a flow, one flow under specific forces that's shaped it into what it needs to be is the flight booking uh, process. Right? I mean, there was a time when none of the airline websites knew how the heck to make an interface for booking a flight, right? And they were all screwing around with different things, right, in the 90s, yeah? And now, the flight booking process is so honed that there's a custom affordances that they had to invent for picking seats, right? I mean, it's so, uh, so narrow and, and, and situation specific that there's a whole series of very specific UI elements that you go through that get the job done quite adequately now, you know, quite well. And what we're seeing here with the addition of the password is, is, is kind of that same thing, that now that we have a constant set of pressures coming from a defined situation, we have a basis for iteration. We know what to improve. We know what thing out there in the world to look at and say, how's it going? How can I make that better? So here's another example. With this approval screen, right, we had approve and deny. Well, we start to learn that what happens is people submit the form and they type in a, a, a version of their name that people don't recognize. You know, like especially f some of our friends from Russia or from Poland, they have, they have a very kind of formal, long first name that uh, they don't use among their friends. And then if they ever fill out some, some form, you don't, you're like, who's that, right? Oh, that's Gosha, okay, right? And um, so there's actually another thing that we need, which is a kind of button to clarify. This is when the person whose job it is to approve says, I, can't, I don't know how to say yes or no. <laughs> I need to ask them something, right? So here's a different flow, right? Now, instead of approve or deny, we've also got clarify. And clarify is gonna go to a distinct screen that's something like ask them a question. And here we're gonna have a send button or cancel. And you can see you kind of get the idea that the, the details of the design are getting more and more crinkly as they adapt to the contours of the, of the real situation that drives it. So uh, I think that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at the time, and I, th <laughs> uh, I think we did all right with, with, with a half hour for that. And I noticed, I, I have to admit, I noticed that they opened the bar at 5.30 which was uncomfortable because I had to go on stage at 515 and, you know, so, I, and I have so much respect for your wishes, you know, and the situation you're in. So, um, I, what, I, what I would like to kind of leave you with is, is this, this picture, which is kind of like the tower of interface design. What you have here is a stack. You have different levels of abstraction. And a lot of us are, are at the 2D layout and we're trying to, f struggle with fitting the puzzle pieces together against an unknown criteria of do I like it or not, right? And you can step up from that by including the third dimension of time. All of these things above affordances, all of these things happen in time, right? And nobody's talking about time. Everybody's posting screenshots in the UI design community of the prettiest button that they ever made, right? So, but time, time, time. Right? And then by thinking through time, we're thinking about actions that have a beginning and middle and end. We're tracing our design requirements up to real life situations that come up. And we're discovering those situations by paying more attention to the experience that we have when we actually embed ourselves in the domain for a while.
Okay? So I hope that that is, is useful for you and, um, you know, uh, we, can, we can chat outside or if, I don't know if we do questions or how it works, but I, this is the first time I've shared this information, so I'd be very interested to hear if anything resonated and if, if, if you have any questions or anything like that. So thank you very much. Shall we do? Shall we do questions? So, any questions? What causes that? <laughs> it's custom. It's very expensive. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, um, nowhere. I'm sorry to say. I'm sorry to say that I was forced by necessity to invent this stuff, <laughs> and. Um, uh, pulled it from a lot of different sources, and, and I think it would be a waste of your time to give you 10 books that each have one drip of source in each one, you know? Um, uh, I would, I hope to put this together into something uh, soon, you know? And then that would have some, that's nice to hear. There are some reference points, but it's, it's, there's no short answer, really, you know? Um, a little bit of this here and there, yeah. Mm -hmm. With what? The yes. Are you talking about which flows to focus on, like which actions or? I see. I see. The thing that I do if I'm working with somebody who's not a programmer or a designer is I want to talk to them about the situation and I don't want to talk to them about my solution. And when I get to a point where I can tell them their situation back to them in a way that their head's totally nodding and it's resonating, then I'm confident that I'm going to be able to extract the right affordances from that. Because it's the understanding of the situation that's pushing the requirements down. Right? And I think that if you wanted to dig deeper into that way of thinking, domain-driven design is good for that. Mm -hmm. Yep. How many flows, uh, do you have like a limit of flows you can do in each like one of those flows? I mean, you can do, with the pin you're doing two flows. Oh, I see. Well, um, there's, a, there's a natural limit to how many meaningfully different things that you want to offer from one dashboard. You know what I mean? If there are 12 completely different concepts for what you could be doing, then probably there's some chunking you could be doing where there's a family of five related things that you're doing and you go somewhere else for those. There's a little bit of an art to that of learning how to group these things and it's a little bit like city planning. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have a very um, uh, uh, something that I'm sure you can try, which is that you throw it away, <laughs> and then um, you don't have to find it. You don't have to remember it. It's it's very easy. The, you know, but a little more seriously, like the code is the source of truth, and so if you're using if you're using bad coding practices, you need a lot of documentation because the code doesn't tell you anything. If you're doing a good job coding, then the code and the product design itself is going to show you, is going to embody this. So the, I think the challenge is to get from identifying this to stubbing it on some branch somewhere so that what you talked about is, is, is embodied in a, in a solution that's real enough that people can start referring to it as a work in progress. And that's, then that, that takes the whole problem away. Uh, yes? Yeah. Uh, jobs to be done is um, how you 
think about the situations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So that kind of gets into, I think it's a basic question of research, right? And um, that depends very much on the situation you're in. So if you're totally cut off from your customer, you don't know any nearby you, you can't go be a, like follow a doctor for a day if it's about doctor's software, right, or whatever it is, you know? The best is if you can, if you know somebody or you can embed yourself in the situation. So it's legal, it's support for some legal team. You go hang out with them and you say, show me what you do, right? Um, I, I think there's no short answer to that because you can, you can, have a, a, you can buy a beer to somebody who, who is in the industry and you ask them questions for hours. You can, there's specific interview techniques you can use. There's, there's tons of research techniques. The main, the main thing I think is that if you value it, then you'll figure it out. You realize, like, I can't make this decision unless I actually know what they go through. So I'm going to have to figure out how to educate myself somehow and make it a priority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so basically what you need to do is you have to figure out how to orthogonalize the, 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 the project. You have to be able to say, here's an area that I'm going to be able to change without touching the other parts. And then there's a lot of techniques in domain-driven design for that. If you guys aren't into domain-driven design, I highly, highly recommend checking out that book. It's fantastic. And you can use patterns like you have a translation layer, anti-corruption layer. There's ways to say, I'm going to leave the old thing there, build a new thing here, and here's this specific point where I'm going to change the interface, right? And then you apply all of this in the safe new area that you've created that's orthogonal to the old parts, right? Uh-huh. I think the best way to give a developer requirements is to give them a, 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 a real interface that, um, that doesn't do what it's supposed to do when you click the buttons. You know what I mean? Like, if you give them, let's say, if you're doing a web app, if you give them HTML screens, even better is if, if you have a designer who can put them on real routes and stuff, but okay, fine. You know? But if you give them real screens, then they can see, here's the endpoints that I need to program against. Right? And also you can have a push and pull and they can say, oh, I don't really want to implement that because that's going to take me forever. Is it really that important? You can say, actually, no, that was just an idea I had. You know, we could also do it this way. So giving a real concrete UI as a, in the medium, in the real medium, if possible, is good. And then if you can't, if it's something like iOS where building the views is going to take so long natively, then you could do high fidelity mockups you know, as a spec. But I wouldn't give any kind of a bullet point type requirement. Uh huh. What tools do you personally use in your workflow? Just this. <laughs> uh, like software, hardware, I don't know. Oh, um, well, this is Good Notes on the iPad Pro with an Apple Pencil. It's great. Also, paper and Sharpie work well, but I like this because I can um, broadcast it and I can share screenshots really easily, you know? Um, and then, uh, whatever, you know, I mean, like, development tools are all the same. I never heard of any. You have opinions about development tools? I never heard about that. Anything else? How do you avoid over specializing a page? Like if the people who are approving users occasionally want to be able to modify some information? Ah, excellent question. Yeah. Um, so uh, you've got some budget of time that you can spend, right? You have to do some kind of a ranking of what, what hurts the most. And uh, so that is just gonna have to be put up against whatever else is, 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 is there as a candidate. You know what I mean? So if, you, if you're hearing a request that we want this thing on approval and it happens 3% of the time, but nobody else is asking for anything, then okay, you have a rainy day, you do it, right? But if you're hearing 3% of the time this happens in approval and it's not that critical, but 3% of the time over here, there's something else happens and people get completely lost or they abandon or there's data loss or, you know what I mean? Then you say, all right, that's more important, right? So you have to, you have to weigh it against the other possibilities and judge what the pain is. 
There's also an upper bound to how much you can cram into one page, right? So that's a factor. Mm-hmm. Mm. We did a project once where um, we had, at the time, we had five different, five different pro four different products, and they all had different user databases, and we wanted to migrate everything to a single sign-on, and then we had to do all kinds of user management and account management stuff that like took all these things that used to be different and put them together, and then we had to build ways to migrate to that, and then to like split things apart afterward, that was pretty gnarly. We'd like, or I, could, I could do without repeating that <laughs> project again. I learned a lot from it, though. So, yes. What's your favorite fine touch point in Basecamp that you designed yourself? Mm. The, um, in the current version, Basecamp 3, um, there's a grid of six tools that are the same size. Um, that uh, there was a lot of there was a lot of struggle to figure out how to present that tool set. And um, what we ended up with is something like a Fisher-Price toy with like six little buckets, you know, and um, it wasn't an obvious path to get to that. So that, and that's one of those, I, I, I like the, um, the design decisions that aren't this like super finessey little thing, but they're the, like the tent pole design decisions where you move that and now the whole structure is more clear, you know, so I'd pick something like that. Mm -hmm. Friends, shall we drink beer? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>